Let's go ahead and review your exam. Will we be going over the correct quiz answers? No. Um, but if you have questions over anything that we did cover on the quiz, oh, it's Diana. That's the ceiling that we're staring at. I was, or at least I think that's Diana. Got like a corner of a forehead. So anyways, are we going to be assigned groups or is that just up to us? It's up to you guys. You guys can pair up. You can say that you're better than everyone and do it on your own, or you can choose to get together. Um, like anything else, you're only gonna be allowed to have a group of up to three people. So, you know, kind of work that out ahead of time, discuss it amongst each other, figure out what's going on. We'll be having a review before the exam. Yes, that's what this is. What format will the final be? Um, well, final is going to be short answer, essay, multiple choice, matching. Um, yeah, what are the main concepts that we need to understand for each of the chapters? Muscle physiology, the history of exercise physiology, cardiovascular physiology. Um, will any of the exam questions be related to what we have done in labs? That's a good question. In reality, if you did a really good job of looking at the literature and understanding the foundations of why we were doing those labs, yes. If you didn't, no. Arrangement of filaments, they are going to be arranged in series and parallel, and that allows us to go ahead and have contraction if we're talking about sarcomeres. If you're talking about collagen, they're also gonna typically be both in parallel and in series, and if we lay them down asymmetrically, that's what's known as scar tissue and doesn't move as well. For history, do we need to know what certain physiologists were known for doing? Yep. Uh, do we also need to know specific years? No. I am confused in certain aspects of the muscle contraction. I'm not sure what exactly is happening during when acetylcholine, I think that was supposed to be binds to the ligand gate receptors. Okay, so when acetylcholine binds to the ligand gate receptor, that is going to allow sodium to start to go into the cell. When sodium goes into the cell, that is going to change the resting polarity. So it's gonna slowly tick its way up until it gets to the threshold. When it gets to the threshold, it's going to open what's known as the voltage gated channels. So those channels become open once we get to a certain level of voltage and that allows sodium to rush into the cell. And that's what gives us an action potential. And then that causes the voltage gated channel next to it to open and so on and so on, literally running in series down the sarcolemma into the T tubules and then through those DHP and ranidine receptors into the cell. What is mTOR? The mechanistic target of rapamycin, previously known as the million target of rapamycin. It is specific in being one of the major components of the anabolic pathways in the body. So you wanna activate mTOR in skeletal muscle because that's a good sign when it comes to trying to build muscle because that in turn is going to activate things like P70S6K and 4-EBP1. However, uncontrolled mTOR activation in other cells in the body is usually looked at, specifically when you're talking about like massive amounts of that activation, that's even cancer. So you don't wanna to have too much mTOR activation because it turns out that's causing the growth of cells and you only wanna have growth in certain cells. How if bone density affect, oh wow. Um, how is bone density affected by exercise? It can improve, okay, I understand the concept of Wolf's Law. Mm -hmm. well, what type of exercises cause the most increase in bone mineral density? Also, does bone density decrease if you stop exercising? So the answer is, to the final part, yes. Your body is constantly adapting to the demands placed upon it. If you don't have to have denser bones, the body's gonna liberate that calcium at some point because what's the point of having all this extra calcium for no good reason? Now, how is it affected by exercise? Well, the greater the impacts, so we're talking about the magnitude of forces that we're going to encounter, the greater amounts of increase in bone mineral density. And so what's really interesting, if you look at the actual like bone mineral density of the neck, your neck bone mineral density for people that just like to lift weights, so they're not an Olympic weight lifter. So we're clear, there's a difference between those two. Their bone mineral density is typically in their neck lower than bone mineral density in long distance runners because long distance runners are constantly pounding on the ground so their head is constantly bouncing through their neck and that actually is going to strengthen those vertebrae. However, the bones of the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, the hips, the femurs, all of those are going to be denser in the lifters compared to a lot of runners. And then people that have huge amount of forces they're dealing with. So these are people that are doing sports that involve a lot of plyometrics, a lot of hard landing. So this would be something like plays a sport with basketball and otherwise, they're gonna have even more bone mineral density. And especially if you're doing a contact and or combat sport where you're running into other people, you're gonna have typically also denser bones, AKA like a football player. 
And what hormone increases osteoblast activity? Okay, so that's going to be influenced a bit by growth hormone, a bit by testosterone, and there's even a little bit of the stress response that in theory is mediated by, um, or the, sorry, stress response that's mediated, mediated through your bones, and that's through epinephrine and cortisol signaling, which that one is really cutting edge stuff, and I don't fully understand it yet, but it was fun to read up on. And that was all the quiz questions I've seen as of whenever I checked them at like two or three this afternoon. Now, what other questions would you guys like me to review for you guys for your midterm exam? Go ahead, Alex. Um, I was just going to follow up again. Do you, do you mind explaining again what mTOR does? Because I was just kind of kind of like ran through it really quick, and it was just hard for me to follow. Okay, no worries. Give me one second. Let me. Okay. So the main point of the myosin light chain is it's causing a slight modification on the speed of contraction in relaxation. Okay. So the basic idea is, I think we talked a little bit before about kind of the size of engine being, you know, that's your myosin heavy chain. That's like, that's the big difference. Your myosin light chain is whether or not you're putting in like 87 or 93 octane. Okay. So if you put in 87 octane in your car normally, but you put in 93, you'll get a little bit more performance out of your engine than you're used to, but it's not like you're going to be lighting the world on fire. The big difference in your car's performance is do you have like a little tiny engine or do you have like a big block V8? So like, yeah, let's pick on Yehor because he's here. What does that car of yours have? Does it even have four cylinders? Is it running on two? <laughs> it's four. It's a 89 Civic, yeah. So all three, of, all four of those thimble sized cylinders are pumping as hard as they can. <laughs> Yehor has to weigh under 200 pounds, otherwise it can't climb hills. <laughs> yeah, that's why that's why I'm trying not to put on weight. Can't take your fiance out in dates on that one unless it's a flat drive. No, no. But it, does that kind of clarify a little bit more what's going on with my and light chain? Yeah, it's just kind of like a slight change. It's like the heavy chains are the ones that actually you see like the big, big uh differences in like I guess the contractile speed of the muscle and the relaxation. Bingo. Okay. So, so if you can go, well, let me think about it. The difference between your first place and second place in like most real athletic competitions is a pretty small difference. So they probably have pretty similar myosin heavy chain. The one might have a slight advantage with the myosin light chain. Okay. So it's one of those things that it's another layer of ways that we can differentiate potential between two different people. Okay. I have a follow-up question with that. So uh, my icing heavy chains then determine the fiber type, right? Type 1, type 2A, type 2B, right? Yes. Yeah. And you, Actually determine. 2X, you consider them the same. Now remember, yeah. guys, one muscle fiber does not always express the exact same fiber type. We have hybrid fibers. So mm -hmm. really what's influencing your fiber type is genetics and then how you're using them. So within that given fiber based upon how you train how you recover how you rest and everything you're going to see transitions or you're going to see more hybrid fibers or less hybrid fibers so my question to you guys is who do you think you'd see more hybrid fibers in someone who's really highly trained or someone who's sedentary i'd say sedentary bingo because they don't have the stimulus on the body to shift the fiber type more towards the expression of what's useful for their athletic endeavor. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Good. Who is the iPhone like that we keep staring at the ceiling? I think it was Dan. Yeah. Just weird staring, like someone just got knocked out and what, they, what they're seeing while they're staring at the ceiling. <laughs> Diana, do you have any questions? You can throw them up in the chat if you don't want to unmute. 
Um, I'm okay. Okay. Fair enough. And so, in all seriousness, when it comes to the main concepts, history is just key is be able to match, you know, the person with what they did. I don't focus too much on memorizing dates, but understanding kind of how things have moved forward, how things have progressed in areas like that's the big key and kind of understanding what obviously wasn't fully understood and what is understood now. When it comes to, you know, skeletal muscle, understanding how it contracts. And what you guys have already asked is how the fiber types are going to contribute to athletic performance. Um, with a cardiovascular side, you know, make sure you understand. Remember that slide when I said, if you understand this slide, you understand the cardiovascular system. So, you know, when we talk about acute modifications to the systems, so what we're doing, you know, when we're exercising to have better performance, and then chronic adaptation, so how the body's really changing thanks to hard training for longer periods of time. So make sure that you can parse between those two. Do we need to, uh, what the, can you go over the fatigue and muscle fatigue and the main um, things that affect it the most or just over muscle fatigue in general? Yeah, okay. So when we're talking about fatigue, we're talking about a loss of contractile ability. And it's going to be down to really effectively two things, lack of energy or lack of trying. Now, when it comes to lack of trying, obviously we're talking about sending acetylcholine. Remember, we can have some altered neuromuscular junction efficiency, altered acetylcholine recycling, uh, and a hyperpolarization of the membrane, aka it becomes even harder to hit threshold to get those muscles to contract. Now, when it comes to fatigue inside the muscle, it requires energy, obviously, to get ATP to cycle on or cycle through myosin to get it to let go of actin. So that's a big energy cause. And then the other side is allowing muscle to relax, requires energy. So we have acute high intensity fatigue, which is going to be due to effectively a lack of ATP available, which is typically thanks to just really, first we exhaust that ATP PCR system, and then we're going to exhaust that anaerobic glycolytic system. And when the pH goes low enough, you literally the enzymes involved in glycolysis no longer work. If they no longer work, you can't keep producing energy that way. If you can't keep producing energy that way, you're not going to be able to keep a force out there. Now, when it comes to long-term causes of fatigue, so this is going to be due to glycogen depletion. This is going to be from aerobic performance, where once again, you cannot produce energy as fast as you would like to. And because of that, you're not going to be able to get your muscles to contract in a coordinated fashion. Now, notice I said coordinated fashion. So when you're really exhausted, what can still happen? Cramps. Bingo, because how is ATP important in muscle relaxation, Yehor? It mice and head releases from the uh, from actin. Bingo. First, it gets let go of actin, and then ATP is important for pumping calcium back into the sarcoplastic reticulum. And that's why, if any of you guys have ever worked out way too hard for what your body was used to, you maybe were like, "My God, like, why won't my hamstrings quit cramping, or my hands quit cramping, or something else?" even though you were perfectly hydrated because you literally didn't have the energy available in those cells to get them to relax. Wow. Yeah, which is a miserable experience, but Lord knows I've been there. And I will continue to go there at different points in time as in my life. So the whole thing with fatigue and it's just like you're you're not your body's not able to to function in the same rate it's at because it's just using up its energy. Remember that's one of the two. Yeah. Is that we can't produce energy fast enough so. to keep up that work output. That's the short term fatigue. Fatigue, sorry. And the long term fatigue is we could keep producing energy as fast as we want, but we don't have the prerequisites. We don't which is usually carbohydrates to keep up that energy output. Okay. How about how about the pH? Uh, when it when the pH drops, it it does it slow down the 
enzymatic reaction that like it cannot contract as more as efficient as it was? So there's the key is with the pH when it goes too low, not only do your actin and myosin start to get a little funky, but the bigger issue is the enzymes involved in glycolysis don't work. So if the enzymes involved in glycolysis don't work, you cannot produce energy anaerobically anymore. And if you can't produce energy anaerobically, well, you can't, it's not gonna give you energy fast enough to keep up that work output. So that's why there's the difference between like high power, high speed fatigue and long distance, long bout fatigue. Do, do the enzymes not work because they, they like de denature or? Okay, so denaturing is like when you go so far that you've just like effectively burn them up so they don't do them anymore or don't work anymore. Okay. All of the proteins in your body are effectively either really, really long strands of amino acids, okay? As soon as they're made, thanks to how they are, they fold in on themselves in very specific ways. Now, the way that they stay folded is partially thanks to literally the pH of the solution they're in. So a certain amount of protons available in the system causes them to form up in the certain configuration. But then when you put in too many protons, certain proteins will start to unfold. And now it doesn't serve its normal purpose because it no longer has its correct configuration, so it works. So, pretty cool. well, go ahead. I'm not saying that, I'm like, that's pretty cool, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, that so the way to think about it is, you know how like, you know, obviously when water freezes, it expands. Mm -hmm. And so, and well, same thing when things are really, uh, but usually like metal, when it's cold, it shrinks. When it's hot, it expands. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. If a key, your key only technically works within certain temperature ranges, but thankfully it never gets to be so hot that your key starts to melt or it never gets to be so cold that your key effectively can't fit in the lock because the lock is shriveled a little bit tighter. So everything is going to change thanks to the environment around it. That was not a good metaphor. I'm going to have to think of a better one for that. So, Jabari, I know you're here now, bud. Do you have any questions? We've already kind of run through everything that's up on the paper in front. You can obviously put up any questions you have in the chat. And I know the only other person we don't have is um, Sam. So as far as the group guys, we're gonna go up to three individuals. Um, you know, you guys can figure out how you guys want to pair up, but that's kind of a shoddy thing because it effectively says out of the four of you here, one of you is not on the team. So, uh, I don't really like how that makes me feel. So, if you guys already have a preferred group of two or three, that's fine. Otherwise, we can, we can figure out a way to make it work. Dr. Lane, do you want to be in my group? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to show up, though. You're going to be on your own. <laughs> I'm going to uh, I'm going to sign in and then like just be away from keyboard the entire time. Or I'm just going to be like playing a video game and just be like, yeah, sure, it sounds good. You got it. Mechanocoupling. Question mark. Okay. That is a term. So when we're talking about mechanocoupling, we're, you're probably referring to actin and myosin, specifically myosin grabbing hold of actin. So that's going to be that coupling and then pulling it on forward. ATP is going to go in, release, hydrolyze, spring back, and then it's going to grab again as long as the active sites are available and spring forward. And that's effectively how you're getting contraction. And the, speaking of, to Alex's question about the way that proteins work, which is pretty cool, is literally those binding sites is it's effectively the clef sticks in the uh, essentially specific domains of the actin where it effectively can grab hold and that's where it's going to pull and then it's going to go to the next part where it has the type of handhold and pulls itself along. So it doesn't create like a true like covalent bond between the proteins. Effectively all those proteins get kind of stuck on each other and then pull each other along. If your mind kind of hurts thinking about it, it's absolutely fine. Can you, can you describe uh, what exactly is happen, happening to the myosin hand when it's uh, binding to actin? Because I know like you have ATP and then it turns into like ADP and then it loses like
Zoom recording. You see how that effectively looks where we're kind of having all of those ribbons. I mean, like that is a huge amount of protein. Okay. So effectively that gray area it doesn't help. <laughs> I was pointing at my screen guys. Could you see um, the gray area is actually where we're going to have the binding actin. So effectively this little component over here is going to be what actually binds to actin interfaces with it. So I don't know if I've got a better picture of it for you guys. So if you think it is these individual little heads and then these sp spots on actin, they're going to literally, now there's literally thousands of them. They're going to go ahead and grab, pull forward. And remember they're doing it kind of a spiral contraction, which is a freaking sweet and cool thing to think about. But it is kind of a hard thing to wrap your head around. Now, that was the first part of your question. Go ahead and give me the second part of that question, Alex. So it needs, um, so I understand everything when it's like, uh, when actin uh, becomes like uh, open and like exposed basically. Um, and I know you need ATP to release the myosin heads from mm -hmm. actin. Mm -hmm. So when it hydrolyzes it, the, the head is, the, when ATP hydrolyzes, the head moves into the, to right, the into position. position. Yeah, got position. And then, is that, is that correct, Dr. Lane? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, when ATP goes in, it's going to release from actin. When it hydrolyzes, yeah. it's going to cock it back. And then it's going to go ahead and uh, bring it forward. Done. Okay. And then when another one binds, it attaches back, right? When no, another no. ATP. Oh, no, no. no. Okay. Because it, after it hydrolyzes, if, the, if it can bind actin, oh, it's going right. to act. And as soon as it binds, oh, okay. it's going to be that power stroke. Okay. So, okay. I actually don't have a good slide on that. I'm going to make sure I have that. In. Yeah. So it, does, it just keeps going. Like it keeps going in that, like, it does it just keep pulling uh, actin as it like keeps getting hydrolyzed? As long as ATP is available. And calcium okay. is still there. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and just keep grabbing and pulling, grabbing and pulling, grabbing and pulling until it effectively butts up against the Z line there's nowhere else to go and then what happens at that point when it gets to the z line does it like just stay cocked back does it stay on actin now that's a very interesting conversation because the problem is okay everybody go ahead and it's a good way roll your wrist down and contract your form as like hard as you can when you're doing this and you're balling everything up, those sarcomeres are up against one another, okay? You're actively trying to cramp the muscle and get as much force to produce, but it can't go anywhere. It's just stuck there. It keeps butting up, but you're having some of them release and some of them try to hydrolyze. That's why it keeps burning because it's not just a stuck position. You're still chewing through AT. Oh, that is uncomfortable, okay? I guess I'm not meant to be a bodybuilder. So you're still going to have that energy turnover because it's an active thing to tell it to grab hold and then release, grab hold and release. And then it's going to grab and kind of just be stuck at the end because it can't go anywhere. It's the equivalent of if you had like a toy car and you kept driving it into the wall, it's still going to use energy. It's just not going to go anywhere because it's going to keep butting up against the wall. Gotcha. Because muscles are sweet, but they are not smart. They simply are as smart as the person operating them, which, you know, I'll stop there. What are the questions you guys have for the exam? Uh, can you go over low frequency fatigue? Yeah, yeah. Um, the basic idea with low frequency fatigue, we're talking about now we're exhausting our stores of our macronutrients, and typically we're talking about carbohydrate. So if we were all to go out to the track and we were going to try to, I told everybody to run as fast as you could. Now, the initial sprint, we're going to be mostly focusing on using the ATP-PCR energy system. That's going to deplete out and probably 
about five seconds for us on average, some of us faster, some of us slower. Then we're gonna be sprinting on relying on the anaerobic glycolytic system. That's where it's gonna burn like an SOB. And we're only gonna be able to keep that up for so long until we're left with aerobic glycolysis. We're gonna be going even slower than we were before. So this is gonna be about the speed you could do for like a 5K. And so you're gonna keep going and going until eventually you're going to exhaust that glycogen store. And beta oxidation typically only runs at two thirds the speed of glycolysis, meaning you're only going to be able to get two thirds the energy, which means you're only gonna be able to literally run at two thirds the speed you were before you effectively hit the wall. Now that's in a pure vacuum where we're really focusing on only each of those energy systems. Obviously all of them are playing into it to a certain extent, but you're, when you're walking for most of you guys to maybe like a, a, a decent, like not like a full blown mall walk, like speed walking, but you're moving at a pretty decent clip. You're going to be utilizing mostly beta oxidation with a little bit of glycolysis in there. When you're just going for a slow walk, you're pretty much just burning fat. And so think of it this way. If I told you to sprint or that run as fast as you can, how far could you go before you depleted that glycolysis? Most of you guys, it's going to be about an hour and a half to two hours. So however fast you can run for that period of time. But if I told you, you know, you could walk as slow as you want, but you had to stay moving. You could, if with proper motivation, you could literally probably walk for days on end with only stopping to use the bathroom. I mean, yeah, you'd be tired, your feet would hurt, but if I told any of you guys that instead of taking the midterm, you had to walk to my house in Lexington on foot and like, I don't know, take pictures every 400 yards so I know that you guys did walk. And as long as you got to my house by whenever I'm leaving for work tomorrow morning at eight something, you'd get an A on the midterm. I think I'd see you all on my lawn at eight something in the morning back to Lexington. So it's, but yes, that's the difference between the high frequency fatigue and the low frequency. Low frequency is really just talking about depletion of glycogen. Did you guys go over um, uh, mechanical overloading? Not really. No. Not really. Could you just so, actually do, 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 see if we can bring up this M Tor signaling? Um, Alex had a great question about the wonderful M Tor signaling and how all this is going to influence pro or activation of M Tor, which in turn is going to cause growth. Really, one of the components here when it comes to actually signaling for uh, muscle building is actually going to come via mechanical transduction, literally meaning exercise itself. And because of that, that damage, what you're going to do is you're going to, in turn, activate that individual fiber to build more muscle effectively. So we're talking about effectively more sarcomeres, so more actin and myosin which in turn is going to allow for obviously greater performance. And so when you're looking at your athletes, you're looking at, you know, adaptation, what's going to go ahead and get you the results that you're looking for. Well, it's always going to come down to the fibers you're stimulating. So if you really want to get more powerful muscles, you not only have to train your muscles, but you also have to make sure that you're training the fibers inside of those muscles that are going to give you the results that you're looking for. Can you go over um, major myofilaments that we really need to know for the exam within the sarcomere? Like, well, besides myosin and actin, like other, like 
Titan and Nebulin and Troponin. Yeah, Troponin. The different isoforms of Troponin. Mm -hmm. Saying the basics of what the costumer is. So when we talk about dystrophin, we talk about how the Z lines are going to naturally do dystrophin glycoprotein complex. We're literally notice here's F actin, here's F actin. So nitrogen side of the amino or yeah, the amino part of the amino acid, the carboxylic acid, and then this is going to in turn allow the force to transduce along the sarcolemma of the muscle. And so this is really important. It's a combination of collagen and a number of other proteins that are going to literally be involved with transduction of force and also signaling of the force that that muscle fiber is having to um, deal with. So remember, if we don't have a, an appropriate dystro dystrophin glycoprotein complex, we're going to literally have our muscle cells fall apart on us when we're using them more frequently. And you know that we're still gonna activate our satellite cells, but at a certain point we're going to exhaust them. And that's the basis of effectively Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And because of that, you unfortunately have a very shortened lifespan because it's really hard on the body and you literally are not able to effectively survive for as long as a normal person because your cells don't behave the way they're supposed to. They literally break easier from training. Anything else you guys want to review on? So should I kind of let you guys we'll call it a day so you guys can focus on studying for your exam? Do you guys know who you want to do groups with? Make sure you take it first as an individual and then you take the exam as a group. If I notice that you took it as a group before you took it as an individual, I'm going to give you a zero on your individual exam because that be cheating and I ain't about that life. But you know, otherwise, do your best. Make sure you think through. For the short answer questions, there'll be multiple parts. So obviously make sure that you're answering each part of those questions. And then since I'm sure some of you guys have taken the quiz since I looked at it earlier, if I see new questions on there that we didn't talk about tonight, I'll record a little thing like this and put that up on the YouTubes so you guys can use that for studying. Thank you. Hey, no worries, guys. Any, anything else? Because I, I don't want to make you guys just chill out and talk to me if you don't want to. Can I talk to you after class? Um, yeah, we'll just kick everybody out in a few moments. Um, and I'll make sure that I stop at recording. One other uh, thing is, guys, remember, we're going to be starting on your next lab pretty soon. And what are we doing? Technical report. Of what, Yehor? I didn't read the directions. <laughs> I haven't read those yet. <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. So we're just going to be looking at doing some velocity based stuff. So it's, it's not too bad, but using the gym aware system, it's, it's actually pretty easy, but it's one of those things that if you guys can figure out a time that you can all come into the lab, obviously during the day this week, we'll introduce you guys to it and then you'll be able to kind of figure it out for whatever movement you're interested in. So sound good to you guys. Is there, is anybody else having trouble getting to blackboard? Just a key. Yeah. Yeah, it's not letting me log in either. All right. This one. <laughs> oh. I thought it was just mine. All right. Well, Jabari, it's good to know that it's not Blackboard has something against you. It has something against everyone. Yeah. And mm, that's not fun. nervous. It's definitely a little nervous. Well, it, it, guys, remember, my, I really want you guys to do well. I want to make sure you guys understand this and you know how to apply this stuff. 
And so, you know, do your best on the exam, study hard, make sure you understand, you know, the major underpinnings, the mechanisms of how all this stuff is going on. And if you have issues, if Blackboard is just being freaking Blackboard, like, we'll figure something out, okay? You guys gonna be all right. Just make sure you stay on top of things. Take those homework quizzes because they're all effectively uh, for extra credit. Well, I wrote them in such a way that you only have to get a 50% to get a full, to get 100% on the homework quiz. And if you get above that, it builds extra credit. So that'll help with your quiz grade. And then obviously if you have concerns about the midterm, it'll give you a little bit more buffer there. So if there's no other big questions, if you don't mind, I'm gonna kick out everybody except for Jabari and I'm gonna stop recording and then he and I can talk. So sound good guys? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Hey, no worries guys. Thank you guys for showing up tonight and stay safe.